Hello everyone and welcome to our online travel program. Our topic for today is small towns and old towns. My name is Montoya and I'm a public librarian at the Indianapolis Public Library. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing practices, there are travel restrictions currently in place. It's imperative that you stay up to date on travel rules so that you know what you're getting into before you book your trip or leave for your vacation. This travel program is intended for personal enrichment purposes only and does not replace independent judgment and research. Please be mindful of your surroundings when traveling. Obey all laws and follow all safety rules, regulations, policies, and procedures when traveling. Here's a look at today's program. We'll travel to Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia, Derby Line, Vermont, Calico, California, Herman, Missouri, Linville, Tennessee, Sonoy, Georgia, the London Borough of Hackney, and Bruges, Belgium. I'd like to add that I've visited every town on our list today. No, you're not getting a travel expert, but you are getting in part a firsthand travel experience for this program. Here's a list of small town themed library books that you can find in NDPL's eMaterials collection. The Lost Continent, Travels in Small Town America, published in 1989. Little Indiana, Small Town Destinations, published in 2016. First stop on our trip is Peggy's Cove, located in Nova Scotia, Canada. This area is referred to as New Scotland, Canada's ocean playground. Nova Scotia is Canada's first province and it was established in 1867. Peggy's Cove is located within the coastal region of Nova Scotia. It's a small and rustic fishing village founded in 1811. With a population around 30, locally owned throughout the coastal region near Peggy's Cove, you'll find gift stores, galleries, cafes, and a bed and breakfast. To get to Peggy's Cove, you won't get there on public transportation. There are a number of options, but some of the most popular are by tour bus or by your own vehicle or renting a car. Once you arrive in Peggy's Cove, you can go hiking, well watching, scenic boat tours, or kayaking. The Peggy's Cove Lighthouse is a real star in these parts. It was built in 1915. It's said to beguile tourists from near and far. It's often referred to as one of the most visited and photographed lighthouses in Eastern Canada. The Peggy's Cove Lighthouse was the only lighthouse in the world to have its own post office until 2009. Folks from all over love to mail postcards home to themselves with the Peggy's Cove postmark. Nova Scotia served as a destination of refuge for Blacks escaping the brutalities of American slavery via the Underground Railroad Network. Here's the earliest known image of a Black Nova Scotian in 1788. He was a woodcutter in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Ivan Fraser is an established artist, photographer, and author born and raised in Nova Scotia. He's written a series of books featuring Peggy's Cove. Now we're gonna to travel to the border towns of Derby Line, Vermont and Stansted, Quebec. These two towns in two separate countries share a local public library. The Haskell Free Library is where half the library is built, built, half the library building sits in Canada and the other half of the building sits in the United States. The population in Derby Line is 625. The town was incorporated back in 1791 the adjacent sister town of Stansted has a population of around 2,800. Here's where it gets interesting. The drinking water for the adjacent towns of Derby Line and Stansted is pumped from wells in Canada, stored in a reservoir in the United States, and distributed through a system maintained by Canadians. Derby Line sewage makes a cross-border trip for treatment. Derby Line shares emergency crews with Stansted. Each responds to calls on both sides of the border. 
The Canadian border has a line has has nine pots of pink and purple petunias and a sign ordering people not to cross the border. I took this photo about seven years ago when I visited Derby Line and you can see the flower pots are right there. You can't see it in the photo, but to the left of the to the left of the picture there was a an SUV with the border patrol watching me take the photo. It was pretty cool to see the line of flower pots is basically that's what you have to designate the border crossing. And this was at one point known as a soft border crossing and I believe this was a through a through street for quite for some for a number of years, but now you have the flower pots blocking it and then you have the border patrol sitting right there making sure nobody tries anything funny. The Haskell Free Library and Opera House opened in 1904 and the building was purposely constructed to straddle the border to serve both communities of, Ber of Derby Line and Stansted. Inside the library, you can enter Canada from the United States just by walking across the room, but you must exit to your home country. And you guessed it, those feet in the middle picture belong to me. I was standing, one side is standing in the US and the other side is in Canada. And to the right, there's a photo with the, you can see the toilet is in the US side and the circulation desk is on the French side, on the Canadian side. Now the librarian speaks both French and English because they serve both communities. The Quebec side is a French speaking province. If your home sits on the line of the border, residents of American homes have to check in with Canadian officials, with customs officials, before every time they leave their homes to drive further into Vermont. And there are quite a few homes that sit on the border. So yeah, they have to check in with Canadian customs every single time they leave their home. A notable Derby Line resident was Willie Johnson. He lived between 1850 and 1941. He was a Medal of Honor Medal of Honor recipient as a drummer boy during the Civil War. There was a book based, based on him. It was called Mr. Lincoln's Drummer Boy. Now we're going to travel to St. Johnsbury, Vermont, with a population of just over 7,200. St. Johnsbury is known as a shire town of the county. A shire town is a town where a court of superior jurisdiction sits, otherwise known as the county seat. This is a photo of the United Community Church. This is a Gothic style church that was built of Isle Lamont stone with ornamental red granite pillars, the interior woodwork of native cherry and artistic window and wall decorations. This is a photo of the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum, an art gallery and of course public library. You can see the words there on the photo that I took when I visited back in 2013. The building was built in around 1871. And this is a very blurry photo that I took. When I took the photo, it looked perfect. And I'm really trying to distract you right now with the words on the screen. So pretend the photo isn't blurry and just focus on the words. The United States Department of Interior designated this the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum, a National Historic Landmark in 1996. The Athenaeum is the one of few libraries in the nation with this prestigious status. On down the road to Rockingham, Vermont, the home of the Vermont Country Store. The population in this town is just over 5,000. The town was first chartered in, this, in 1753. The store itself was founded in 1946 and operated by the Orton family. This is a photo of the Vermont Country Store Kissing Bridge. Lots of people come to the store. They all want their photo in front of the Kissing Bridge. Here's the marketing from the Vermont Country Store. It's an old tradition from the horse and buggy days when a boy would stop halfway across a covered bridge where it was quiet to give his girl a kiss. Old timers used to call all covered bridges kissing bridges and somehow the name stuck to ours. Now we're gonna hop across the pond to London, England. London is the capital city of England in the United Kingdom, the 21st century city with the history stretching back all the way to Roman times. When we think of London, we think of telephone booths or call boxes that double-decker bus that you see in the photo there. We may think of the Palace of Westminster or the London Eye. We think of Westminster Abbey and also the changing of the guard. And no trip to London is complete without a photo in front of the gate of Buckingham Palace. 
But today we're going to take a different path. We're going to head all the way to East London to the London Borough of Hackney. The London Borough of Hackney is one of 32 boroughs in London created over 50 years ago by the London Government Act of 1963. The first real records of settlement in Hackney date back to the Saxon times. The area was favored by wealthy Londoners from the Middle Ages until the 19th century. In the London Borough of Hackney, they have a number of street markets. Broadway Market is just one of seven street markets that they hold in the area. Every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., you can sample local sweets and treats, the local fruits and vegetables, or you can take a walk through the London Fields Park. The park's history is rec was recorded as early as the 13th century. The park has been known as London Fields since the mid 16th century. The name itself was registered in 1540 when the park was used to pasture livestock before taking them to market. If you're visiting Hackney during the month of September, don't miss the Hackney Carnival. Fabulous dance routines, feathers, glitz, and booming beats are set to bring the borough streets alive on 8th of September for the return of the Hackney Carnival. The Hackney Carnival dates back to the early 1970s and was first organized by the African and Caribbean community. The carnival includes spectacular costumes, energetic dancing from over 800 performers in a parade, live music stages, street art, and 30 stalls of food from all about the world. East London notable residents include actress Jessica Tandy, actor Michael Caine, and my personal favorite, actor Idris Elba. Bruges, Belgium, with a population of over 100,000, the history of the city stretches back to the 9th century when it was founded by Vikings. Bruges was a sleepy medieval town until the construction of a port and the cutting of a connecting canal which opened in 1907. Today, Bruges depends largely on tourism. In Bruges, you can see charming cobblestone, cobblestone streets, sample beer, frites and mayonnaise, and they were delicious. Bruges is known for being a chocolate mecca. There are touristy price shops, or you can try the local supermarket. Bruges is known for their canals. Bruges is often referred to as the as the Venice of the North because of their romantic and picturesque canals. The town's beautiful architecture attracts more than 2 million visitors every year. Key of the Rosary is one of the most photographed sites throughout the city of Bruges. Following dinner at the Hobbit Grill restaurant, yes, that's a real place, we ate there. <laughs> we walked back to our hotel and I will say this section of the city at night was one of breathtaking beauty. Now we're gonna head back into the United States to California, specifically Calico, California in the Mojave Desert. This is a small and old mining town founded all the way back in 1881. The population in 1890 was just 3,500 3, people. The population today is zero. Back during the town's heyday, 13 million to $20 million in silver and 9 million in board materials were mined between 1881 and 1907. Today, Calico is part of the San Bernardino County Regional Park System, visited by people from all around the world. And I'll give you an idea of how I discovered this town. I was driving home from our Route 66 road trip. We were heading back from California, back to Indiana, stopped at a gas station, and I saw on a postcard um, a sign that uh, the postcard said something about Calico. I looked it up and I said, well, it's not very far off my trip. Maybe I'll stop by. And it, we, so we decided to do this little side trip and it was really gorgeous. I love this town because it has a really wonderful history of the, the mining, the mining that took place back in the 1800s, the historical buildings. They have mine tours. If you, if you're, if you're not claustrophobic, you'll be fine. Um, but, um, it was really wonderful. They have a lot of, just a lot of history in this town. It is a ghost town, but they keep it going. Um, it's a really nice place to go. The one thing I will say is that you need to plan ahead. Don't do it at the spur of the moment like I did. 
I should have planned ahead and I didn't. I recommend that you look at the website and the website that you see on your screen and see what you, if you want to go to this town, see, plan your trip. Um, look at all, you know, work out all the logistics, bring bottled water. I didn't have any bottled water. Talk about being in the middle of the desert when it's like 120 in the shade and I had no bottled water in this desert town, but it was really beautiful. I love historic towns. I like history. I like finding out what, what people did there, what the, the main industry, of course, was mining. And like I said, they had a mine, a mine tour that you could take. If you don't, if you're not afraid of of being underground, it's a really wonderful thing. So um, again, highly recommend that you just take, do your do your due diligence and plan your trip ahead. Do not do it like I did, just see a postcard and decide to stop by. All right, now we're gonna go to Herman, Missouri. In 1837, a group of German immigrants settled Herman, Missouri. Herman has been designated by the National Geographic as one of America's best adventure towns. It's located on the banks of the, of the Missouri River. Herman, Herman boasts beautiful views, breathtaking scenery, and a rich German culture that will invite, invite you back over and over. Herman is located about an hour and a half from St. Louis. The local grocery store is a save a lot. The nearest Walmart is over an hour away. If you're planning on having a late dinner, you better think again. Some of the restaurants close between 7 and 8 p.m. The population in Herman is just around 2,300. This is a photo of the concert hall, which was built in 1878. The concert hall is the oldest continually operating tavern west of the Mississippi. On the first floor, the saloon was a favorite gathering place for locals and a destination for fun-loving St. Louis folk. The upstairs hall hosted plays, lectures, dances, and concerts. The Herman Star Mills is located on East First Street. It's the first steam powered grist mill in Herman. It was built in 1867 for around $40,000. This is a photo from the interior, the machine shop on the first floor of the Star Mills. It's taken around 1930. The design in the mill is typical of the hundreds of small-scale grist mills and operations before the Depression was transformed flour milling into a large-scale industry. This is a photo of the German Historical Sites Tour. We toured two historic homes in the area. Um, the first home was the Straley House, which was built in 1842. Inside the home were a number of artifacts. This is the step garden located directly behind the home. And inside the home was a, mine, a wine making room. The wine barrel was found in a cave and survived prohibition. This was so exciting. I don't know why I don't like wine, but I was so excited for this barrel that was found in a cave after being there for many, many years. The date on the barrel was 1875. On down the road was the Palmer Gentner House, which built, it was built in 1840. And behind the home was a, just a traditional four square demonstration garden. It was said that the family in the home needed to plant and consume at least 100 head of cabbage per person for the year to have enough food for the winter. This is a photo of the White House Hotel, which was built in 1868 and is located on Wharf Street in Herman. Located in the historic district overlooking the Missouri River and built in 1868, the hotel is a three-story brick building with a two-story wing containing 36 rooms. It is enhanced by the original cast iron balconies, carved stone, carved stone keystones above the windows, beautiful woodwork under the eaves, and rising high above is the iron-railed widow's walk. Now we're gonna head south into Linville, Tennessee. The population is just 279. It's located in Giles County, settled in 1809. It's a friendly small town located one hour and 10 minutes south of Nashville, or as my grandmother used to say, about a half an hour or so from the Alabama border. The Linville Railroad Museum contains railroad memorabilia and model train layout. The photo you see is of a 1927 Baldwin Steam locomotive. When you're in Linville, you can sample the fried pies, the soda pop junction, Big Johnny's Burgers, City Hall, go to the public library, or stop at a bank. Why you would need to go to the City Hall, who knows? You may have some important court documents, no judgment. <laughs> 
You can also stop by the antique shop, the gift shop, or distillery, or the vineyard. Favorites from the vineyard include wild honey, wine jellies include apple and strawberry. On down the road, just down the road from Main Street, is the Round Hill AME Church. This church is significant because it was established all the way back in 1884. And you can see the names of the people that established the church. Two of those names are significant to me because they were my relatives on both sides of my family. On my grandmother's side, you had Harrison Gordon. On my grandpa's side, you had John Braden. A notable Linville resident is Jordan Braden Sr. He served in the Civil War in the 110th Regiment of the United States Colored Infantry. We are so proud of him here in my family because if he had not served in the Civil War and survived, I would not be here today. He was my great, great grandfather. On down further south to Sonoy, Georgia. Sonoy is a city located 35 minutes southwest of Atlanta and Coweta County. The city was first, or the town was first settled in 1860. The first settlement in the area was called Location, two miles south of present-day Sonoy, where a post office had been established. The current population is 4213. One thing for visitors to note about Sonoy, so although you might think Sonoy would most likely be pronounced Sonoya, don't be fooled, locals simply call it Sonoy. If you want to stand out like a sore thumb, however, feel free to mispronounce Sonoy. No one will say anything, but everyone will know you are not a local. When you're in Sonoy, they have a beautiful public library. It's the Coweta County Public Library System, and this is the Sonoy branch. You can also visit a number of jewelry and antique shops. They have restaurants, ice cream, coffee, pizza, a bed and breakfast, and this is a photo of the Georgia Mercantile Company store. Also in the Sonoy, you can learn more about the history of the town by visiting the Sonoy Area Historical Society Museum, and it's located just a short walk from downtown Main Street. The museum opened in 2010, and it's staffed by dedicated volunteers every Friday and Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m. Admission, admission is free, but they do accept donations. Inside the historic home, the central hall and five rooms are filled with memorabilia that bring the story of Sonoy to life. The, historical the historic artifacts include original land lottery deeds from the 1820s, ration coupons from the 1940s, share the space with personal artifacts like a 1939 embroidered signature blouse and a 1941 Girl Scout scrapbook. And history buffs can spend time in the newly established research library, which contains local reference books along with personal accounts and memoirs of the townspeople. When you're in Sonoy, they also have a historic district and the Sonoy Driving Tour of Homes has over 40 homes and two churches on a self-guided tour. A brochure includes a map as well as information about each location and be on the lookout for homes you might have seen in a movie. This is a photo of the Fried Green Tomatoes House. If you remember that movie, it came out in 1991 and it starred Kathy Bates and Jessica Tandy. Other movies filmed in Sonoy, Driving Miss Daisy, Footloose, I'll Fly Away, the TV show, The Fighting Temptation, Mama Flora's Family, and Sweet Home Alabama. And no trip to Sonoy is complete if you're a Walking Dead fan without going to the Walking Dead filming locations. I have toured, I believe, almost every single legally accessible Walking Dead filming location between season one and season eight. I am a huge Walking Dead fan. I, Sonoy is my favorite place to go. I've been to all, and so many, I'm not going to say all of them, but so many filming locations. I could do a whole travel program of nothing about, uh, but Walking Dead filming locations, but I'm not. That's a whole other program for something else. But just so you know, if you're a Walking Dead fan or you know someone who's a Walking Dead fan, definitely Sonoy is a good place to check out. Here's some additional small town theme library books. Check the NDPL online catalog for availability. 
Small Town Girl by Laverle Spencer. She's one of my favorite authors. It's a fiction book. It is available for checkout if you want to try to, um, to use the URL that you see on your screen there. And Welcome to Utopia, Notes from a Small Town, published in 2010. Again, I just want to remind everyone that due to the COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing practices, there are travel restrictions currently in place. Again, it's imperative that you stay up to date on travel rules so that you know what you're getting into before you book your trip or leave for your vacation. I just want to thank everyone for viewing this online travel program. This is my second one. And again, I know I made a few mistakes and I, I do apologize, but I'm getting better. And if you have any special requests for upcoming online travel program topics, feel free to email me at mbarker at ndpl.org. And if you have any questions or any comments or feedback, welcome that as well. Have a great day and stay safe.